Hello everyone so far. Welcome to this webinar and thank you for joining the Africa Conference opening session and keynote address. We would just wait a few more minutes to allow everyone to join this session. Welcome to anyone who has just joined us. I will move on now to talk through the ground rules. Please take a moment to familiarize yourself with our ground rules. As this webinar is provided with simultaneous interpretation, everyone should select a language room. You'll see an icon, uh, a world icon at the bottom of the screen. Uh, please select English, French or Portuguese. Please chat directly with the host, uh, which is the Publish What You Pay Secretariat, if you have any technical difficulties uh, using the drop down in the chat to selection. Um, feel free to use the chat page and you can select all panelists and attendees in the drop down. And this will allow you to speak to everybody to introduce yourselves. And please use the Q&A section to ask your questions to the panelists. And if someone has asked a question that you are interested to hear answered, then please vote for it using the thumbs up icon. By participating in this webinar, you are agreeing to uphold the code of conduct, which will be shared now as a link in the chat box. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and a link will be made available shortly after. Now, if we're ready, I can hand over to you, Demba Sadie, who will now be moderating this session. Thank you, everyone. Merci beaucoup, Henriette. Merci beaucoup, Sandrine, pour tout le travail derrière la scène qui nous permet aujourd'hui de nous réunir et parler à l'ensemble des participants africains. Bienvenue à tous, mesdames et messieurs, en vos rangs et qualités, d'où que vous nous rejoignez, de l'Afrique, de l'Europe, de l'Amérique et de tous les autres pays où vous êtes, nous avons le plaisir de vous accueillir à la septième édition de la conférence Afrique de publier ce que vous payez. La Conférence Afrique se tient tous les trois ans, comme vous savez, et se présente comme le principal espace de rassemblement où les membres de plus de ce que vous payez de toute l'Afrique peuvent élaborer des stratégies, discuter de leurs expériences et les partager, apprendre les uns des autres et faire avancer l'agenda de transparence des industries extractives. Pour ceux qui nous suivent et ne sont pas de plus de ce que vous payez, J'ai envie de rappeler que Publier ce que vous payez est un réseau mondial d'organisation de la société civile qui milite pour une gouvernance transparente et redevable des ressources naturelles. Avec plus de 1000 organisations membres et 51 coalitions nationales, dont 29 en Afrique, notre force réside dans la capacité à coordonner des actions à l'échelle 
national, local et mondial, en maximisant surtout notre impact collectif, afin que chacun bénéficie des ressources naturelles, aujourd'hui comme pour demain aussi. Nous avions l'habitude de tenir la Conférence Afrique en mode présentiel. Cependant, comme vous le savez tous, l'année dernière, 2020, nous avons assisté à des développements troublants et sans précédent liés à la réaction de la communauté mondiale face aux menaces causées par le COVID-19, le coronavirus. Des menaces à notre santé, des menaces à notre mode de vie et des menaces à nos moyens d'existence même. Cette situation avait poussé le comité de pilotage Afrique a reporté la conférence Afrique qui était prévue l'année dernière du 6 au 8 juillet 2020 à Arusha, en Tanzanie. Pour des raisons de force majeure surtout, c'est-à-dire hors de notre contrôle, pour des raisons de santé et de sécurité de tous les membres et partenaires de publier ce que vous pouvez. Vu la croissance et la sévérité de la crise sanitaire et humanitaire, je dirais même, à laquelle nous faisons toujours face actuellement et qui perturbe les vies de millions de populations dans le monde avec son lot de décès, y compris à travers le continent africain. Et suite à des consultations et des échanges avec plusieurs acteurs, dont les membres de Publier ce que vous payez, les partenaires, les instances de gouvernance de Publier ce que vous payez, le comité de pilotage avait finalement décidé d'organiser la conférence en mode virtuel, c'est-à-dire en ligne. Parce que aujourd'hui, nous avions besoin de nous réadapter dans le contexte de la euh, COVID-19. Alors, la conférence Afrique, cette fois-ci, constitue à la limite la première rencontre africaine organisée en ligne. Une mesure qui résulte, comme je l'ai dit tout à l'heure, de la pandémie de COVID-19. Alors, la conférence s'ouvre aujourd'hui et jusqu'à demain, avec un certain nombre de panels, dont un panel multi-acteurs aujourd'hui, ensuite qui sera suivi euh, de cette, après cette cérémonie d'ouverture, euh, d'un mot ou d'un discours discours inaugural qui sera présenté par Dr. Claude Kabemba. Après cela, il y aura différentes thématiques à discuter aujourd'hui et demain, bien sûr, le troisième jour qui sera ouvert tout simplement aux membres de publier ce que vous payez. Nous allons analyser une large panoplie de thématiques dont les droits des femmes comme priorité dans la gouvernance des ressources naturelles, le rôle que le public ce que vous payez pourrait avoir dans la transition énergétique, la transparence des contrats, les questions fiscales, toutes ces thématiques vont être abordées aujourd'hui et demain. Et nous vous invitons à venir participer massivement avec de brillants panélistes. Vendredi, le dernier jour, c'est-à-dire le 26, les membres de public ce que vous payez vont adopter le manuel de gouvernance, c'est-à-dire la charte Afrique. Ils vont le CPA va présenter son rapport narratif 2017 à nos jours. Et ensuite, on va s'assurer que les nouveaux membres du comité de pilotage sont installés et pourront effectivement prendre service déjà présent. Alors, nous avons trois objectifs fondamentalement pour cette conférence Afrique. C'est de renforcer le rôle et la sphère d'influence de la société civile de façon générale et de publier ce que vous payez de façon spécifique pour promouvoir un secteur éducatif transparent, responsable, durable et équitable en Afrique. Deuxième objectif, c'est de voir jusque-là quelles sont les leçons que nous pouvons tirer de la mise en œuvre de notre vision 2025 qui a été adoptée en 2019. Quelles sont les grandes réalisations que nous avons eues quels sont les défis que nous avons rencontrés et quelles sont les autres opportunités qui s'offrent à nous tous en tant qu'organisation de la société. Et enfin, comme vous le savez, le dernier jour, nous nous attellerons à assurer une gouvernance adéquate de publier ce que vous payez en Afrique 
en renouvelant, bien sûr, le comité de pilotage Afrique. Mesdames et messieurs, c'est avec ces mots que je voudrais tout de suite introduire euh, notre, nos panélistes qui vont d'abord euh, passer par cette session inaugurale, dont M. Moutousso Dilao, qui est le président du comité de pilotage Afrique. Ensuite, on écoutera le discours du ministre ougandais qui devait normalement être présent à cette manifestation si elle était tenue en physique. Et enfin, Madame Elisa Peter, qui est la directrice exécutive de publier ce que vous payez, vous adressera son mot de bienvenue. On suivra bien sûr le discours inaugural qui sera présenté par Claude Kabemba. Je reviendrai sur la présentation détaillée de Monsieur Claude Kabemba. Ceci dit, si M. Moutousso Dilao est prêt, je vais lui céder la parole. Moutousso, si vous êtes prêt, la parole est à vous. Moutousso? Moutousso, vous êtes prêt? Je crois que M. Moutou rencontre quelques soucis de connexion. Euh, S'il n'est pas prêt, je crois que je vais changer l'ordre de passage. Alors, Moutou, si vous avez des difficultés de connexion, je préfère passer la parole à Mme Elisa et je change l'ordre de passage. Chers participants, avec votre permission, je passe la parole à Mme Elisa Peter qui va introduire son discours. Bienvenue en attendant que nous puissions avoir M. Moutousso en ligne. Merci. Merci. Je pense que nous devons mute um, somebody. Ah, uh -huh, sorry. Thank you. Um, So, uh, good morning, everybody. I am going to speak in English because I think there so, some people had uh, trouble getting um, the English translation from Demba's uh, speech earlier. So just to remind all of you that there are languages rooms and I invite uh, the French speakers now to go to the French language room at the bottom of the screen. So thank you again, uh, Demba, for setting the stage and a very warm welcome to all of you to this seventh edition of the Publish What You Pay Africa conference. It's really a true pleasure to be with you today. As uh, Demba just reminded us now, the conference was originally supposed to be hosted by our coalitions in Tanzania, Uganda and Kenya last year and we were all looking forward to meeting in Arusha. Little did we know that a, a virus would turn the world upside down and, and prevent us from person. So while it's a pity not to be able to meet physically, hosting the event virtually has given us the opportunity to open up the conference to um, publish what you pay allies alongside publish what you pay members. And we hope that this contributes towards the solidarity and the connections that we need across movement in order to be effective. And let me take this opportunity to recognize here the historic decision taken by the Publish Web Ipe Africa Steering Committee to make this Africa conference virtual. It was not an easy decision. And also, I, I want to, to thank my colleagues at the Secretariat, at the Publish Web Ipe Secretariat, who have raised the challenge of organizing such a large convening online. So thank you to Nelly Busingi, 
Demba, Saidi, Eric Bissil, Sandrine Levy, Stephanie Rochford, and others at the Publish What UP Secretariat who really pulled forces to put this event together. The backdrop for this year's conference is an unprecedented and daunting one. The COVID-19 pandemic has had de devastating impacts on people, on communities, on economies around the world. In Africa, but also elsewhere, it has amplified the resource curse from Nigeria to Zambia, to the Democratic Republic of Congo and more. A drop in oil prices, a rise in unemployment and skyrocketing public debt, combined with continued governance challenges and a public health crisis could threaten to undermine our efforts to promote a people-centered agenda for the extractive sector and to expose corruption. The pandemic has also accelerated worrying trends in closing civic space, with many governments passing more restrictive laws, curbing fundamental liberties in the name of protecting public health. Authorities have increasingly been using excessive force against citizens, especially those gathered in protest of lockdown measures, for instance, in Guinea and, and Uganda, or those who have exposed cor government corruption, like in Zimbabwe, for instance. It's a bleak picture. But against the odds, in 2020, as they have always done, Publish what UP members in Africa rose to the challenge. They have continued to show exceptional courage, resilience, determination. And I would like to draw your attention to a couple of examples that have particularly inspired me over the past year. In Burkina Faso, l'Association des Femmes du Secteur Minier du Burkina, a Publish what UP member organization, has been leading on drafting a new charter on gender mainstreaming in the extractive sector by ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States. This is a truly groundbreaking initiative. The coalition in Burkina is also developing an inclusive civil society position on gender mainstreaming to ensure that women's voices and needs inform the shaping of natural resource governance throughout West Africa. And across that region, Publish What UP members have contributed to more inclusive civil society rep representation on EITI multi-stakeholder mm -hmm. groups by encouraging and supporting women's participation in the MSG. Going to Nigeria, in Nigeria, the Publish What UP coalition collaborated with the coalition in the United Kingdom to use project level, level payment data from the EITI and from other sources to research a couple of emblematic extractives projects. The report found that multinationals paid about $360 million in 2018 alone to the Niger Delta Development Commission. So that's the federal government agency in Nigeria that's responsible for facilitating sustainable development in the Niger Delta. But communities in the Niger Delta have seen negligible benefits from those $360 million. The report published today simply asks, where is the money go going? Despite millions of dollars meant to benefit Delta communities, changing hands every year, the region remains one of the most polluted places on earth. This report was released this morning, and I really encourage you to check the Publish What You Pay website and to participate in the Twitter chat after the last session today with the authors of the report. Let's go to Niger. In Niger, in September, three Publish What You Pay members were finally released after spending six months in jail on fabricated charges following a concerted campaign by Publish What You Pay and other civil society organizations around the world calling for their release. They had been arrested for protesting against the alleged embezzlement of huge sums of public money by the Ministry of Defense in Niger. 
Unfortunately, members and partners in other countries, such as Equatorial Guinea, Congo Brazzaville, and the DRC continue to feel the brunt of government pushback, threats, and arrests. Finally, 2020 also saw the launch of Publisher UPE's global campaign to disclose the deal, calling for the public disclosure of all contracts regulating the exploitation of oil, gas, and minerals. The global campaign builds on successful campaigns at the national level, including in Kenya and in Nigeria, and we expect this campaign to grow this year to include more coalitions. So watch this space. This is an important strategic shift in the life of the global coalition, which paves the way for more transnational, coordinated, high impact advocacy campaigns led by the movement and supported by the Secretariat, including on issues such as the climate crisis, which the publisher IPE Global Council is currently debating with the view of endorsing the first ever set of global publisher IPE positions on the energy transition at its next meeting in April. Publisher IPE members, these are only some of your achievements and I simply can't do justice to all your hard work and the changes that you're contributing to in, in just a few minutes. Despite the pandemic, despite the old and the new challenges we face, you have all continued to lead the charge against corruption, injustice and inequality, day in and day out. Thank you. Thank you, especially on behalf of the communities that are impacted by extractive projects. There have been setbacks and disappointments. Perhaps the most public one being that last week, Shell and Eni were found not guilty of corruption relating to the purchase of a Nigerian oil field, OPL 245. But I know that if anything, this decision will only reinforce our collective determination to ensure accountability in the extractive sector. Business as usual is just not an option any longer for extractive companies. Before I conclude, I wanted to welcome a number of new partners around the table today, representing sister organizations from the women's rights movement, the tax justice movement, the climate change movement, the open government movement and others. We are broadening the conversations that we're having this week to include these partners as we recognize the imperative to establish broader civil society coalitions to affect change on the continent and to create compelling narratives and, and powerful cross-movement alliances to address the complex and interconnected challenges that will confront us in the coming years. Entrenched inequalities, ever more powerful corporations, climate chaos, and the enrichment of a tiny elite at the expense of the rest of us. Let me close by expressing on behalf of all Publish What You Pay members in Africa, my sincere gratitude and appreciation to the outgoing members of the Africa Steering Committee for their leadership over the past four years in advancing Publish What You Pay's agenda across the continent. Mutusu Diwayo from Zimbabwe, Tiamoko Sangare from Mali, Erisa Danladi from Nigeria, Duplex Gwenzop from Cameroon, and Bruce Makoso from the Republic of Congo. Thank you. Thank you for your commitment and your tireless efforts over the past few years. You leave an impressive legacy of a cohesive and engaged movement on the continent and a revised Africa charter that among other things enshrines the principle of gender equality in our governance structures. Now more than ever, we need to stand together in solidarity in order to build a world where everyone benefits from their natural resources today and tomorrow. A world of open societies, 
in which all people can take part in decisions that affect them and hold the powerful to account. That's the mission we committed to delivering for the communities we serve in our Vision 2025 strategy. It is our responsibility to collectively deliver that mission in Africa, leveraging the power, the energy, expertise, and creativity of the Publish What You Pay movement across the continent. Thank you very much. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Merci, Madame Elisa, pour ces mots bienvenus, ces discours poignants qui rappellent effectivement tous les efforts euh, jusque-là entrepris par les couper pour renforcer la gouvernance des ressources naturelles. Merci aussi pour le mot adressé à l'ensemble des membres du comité de pilotage Afrique pour les efforts sans relâche pour la gouvernance de toutes les secouper. Euh, nous allons tout de suite avoir le discours du ministre du Développement des Ressources Minérales de l'Ouganda, honorable Sarah Opendi Atien, euh, qui va passer tout de suite en mode vidéo parce que nous avons préenregistré son discours. Tout de suite, la technique, si vous êtes prêt, on peut faire passer le discours. The executive director, Miss Elsa Peter, for Publish What You Pay International. Executive director, Mr. Mutuso Diliwayo, the African Steering Committee for Publish What You Pay. Executive committees of the Publish What You Pay National Coalitions in Uganda, invited participants, ladies and gentlemen. I thank you for the invitation to give these opening remarks at the Publish What You Pay Conference 2021, which is being run virtually. I have learned that Publish What You Pay is a global movement of civil society organizations working to make oil, gas, and mineral resources and their governance open, transparent, accountable, sustainable, and responsive to all people. Government of Uganda promotes transparency and accountability in the extractive sector. Article 2441 of the Ugandan Constitution provides that minerals and petroleum in Uganda are held by the government on behalf of the people of Uganda. And the government has done very diligently this the Mining Act of 2003 vests the ownership and control of all minerals in Uganda in the government to provide for the, for the acquisition of these mineral rights and provide for other related matters. Similarly, Section 55 of the Public Finance Management Act provides for the petroleum revenue management. It states that the collection, deposit, management, investment, and expenditure of petroleum revenue, which are accrues to government from the exploration of petroleum resources in Uganda, will be managed transparently. Section 10 of the mining policy provides that Uganda shall promote regional and international cooperation in the development and management of the mineral subsector. More importantly, the theme of the third national development plan from 2020-2021 to 2024-2025 is sustainable industrialization for exclusive growth, employment, and sustainable wealth creation. Similarly, the, the NRM Manifesto also promotes transparency, accountability, and sustainable utilization of revenues from extractive uh, resources. The government of Uganda promotes national, regional, and international standards that promote transparency and, accountab and accountability in the extractive sector. At the regional level, Uganda is a signal to the 206th pact on security, stability, and development in the Great Lakes region. Protocol 9 of the pact is against the illegal exploitation of the natural resources. And in 2017, Uganda ratified the protocol and is in advanced stages of implementing the regional certification mechanism. Uganda, as well, is a signatory to the African mining vision which is a policy framework established by the African Union in 2009 to promote equitable, 
broad-based development through prudent exploitation and utilization of the, con of the continent natural wealth. In February of 2019, Uganda government made a decision to join the Extractive Industry Transparency International, EITI, and has now established a national market sector stakeholder group to steer the process. By 12th August 2020, Uganda was officially admitted to join EITI, having submitted its, can its candidature application to the International EITI Secretariat in July of 2020. Ladies and gentlemen, Section 6 of the Mining Policy provides for the role of civil society and cultural institutions. This policy recognizes the role civil society organizations and cultural institutions can play through advocacy, mobilization, and dialogue with communities. The role of civil society organizations in the implementation of this policy shall include A, promoting transparency and accountability among mining industry players while developing and implementing mining projects. The government of Uganda would like to associate with the global strategy for publishing what you pay, Vision 2025, which is a people-centered agenda for the extractive sector. I would like, therefore, to declare the first public What You Pay Africa conference that is being held virtually, uh, considering uh, the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic open. I thank you for God and my country. My names are Robert Kasande, Permanent Secretary of the Ministry of Energy and Mineral Development, on behalf of the Minister of State for Mineral Development, Honorable Sarah Opendi. Merci beaucoup au discours de, du ministre d'État, Sarah Opendi Hatien, ministre d'État en charge du développement des ressources minérales de l'Ouganda. plaisir d'avoir aussi les autorités qui pourraient participer à nos actions et nos activités pour pouvoir effectivement bénéficier des échanges riches qu'ils vont avoir entre les différents partenaires. Je rappelle encore une fois, après cette cérémonie, nous aurons différentes Laquelle, auquel nous vous invitons euh, avec beaucoup de plaisir. Euh, tout de suite, nous allons passer la parole à M. Moutiso Doyo, euh, qui est le président du comité pilotage Afrique. Le comité pilotage Afrique est l'instance de gouvernance de la coalition PBC pour le mouvement en Afrique, euh, qui est composé de l'ensemble des différents représentants des régions de se couper en Afrique Quatre, plus de représentants de tout de se couper au niveau du conseil d'administration de l'ITE. Nous tous aussi, vous m'entendez et que votre connexion est rétablie, euh, nous aurons au nom du comité pilotage Afrique que vous dirigez. Moutousso, vous nous entendez? Est-ce que Moutousso, vous nous entendez? Je, je ne suis pas sûr qu'il nous entende parce qu'il est actuellement dans une zone qui n'est pas suffisamment couverte par le réseau en mission dans des zones un peu éloignées des régions urbaines. Vous, tous, vous nous entendez parce que nous ne vous entendons pas. Alors ça, c'est aussi l'autre difficulté pour les réunions en ligne. Euh, parfois, si on a des difficultés de connexion, cela peut effectivement poser quelques soucis. Moutousso, vous nous entendez? Malheureusement, Moutousso ne nous entend pas jusqu'à présent. Moutousso? Ah. 
Alors, Moutousso ne nous entend pas, ce qui fait que, à ma qualité de modérateur et avec votre permission, euh, nous allons passer à la suite. Il est toujours bloqué pour des questions de connexion. Moutousso Moutousso, vous nous entendez maintenant? Parfait. Alors, euh, chers participants, chers conférenciers, euh, je crois que nous allons passer à l'étape suivante. Nous avons le discours inaugural qui nous sera présenté par M. Claude Kabemba. J'ai envie de rappeler que M. Claude Kabemba est un expert en économie politique il jouit aujourd'hui de 24 ans d'expérience dans la recherche, dans la politique et le plaidoyer pour la gouvernance démocratique, le développement et les droits de l'homme en Afrique. Le domaine d'expertise de M. Kabeba comprennent la question de démocratie, la gouvernance des ressources africaines, la question de l'État africain, la société civile, l'engagement communautaire, ainsi que la résolution des conflits, avec une expérience de terrain, notamment en Afrique australe et en Afrique centrale. M. Kabeba dirige une organisation qui s'appelle Southern Africa Resource Watch, qui est basée en Afrique du Sud, une organisation panafricaine qui est spécialisée dans la gouvernance des ressources naturelles, aussi bien les minéraux que le pétrole. M. Kabeba et titulaire d'un doctorat en relations internationales. Avec votre permission, euh, jusque-là, nous n'avons pas pu joindre Moutousso. Il a des soucis de connexion pour nous rejoindre. J'ai envie de passer la parole à M. Kabemba pour son discours inaugural. Voilà. Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, from wherever you are following us. Uh, Chair, thank you so much uh, for giving me the floor. I am humbled to have uh, this opportunity to speak to this important conference. I want to thank the global and African leadership of publisher to pay for the opportunity. Publisher to pay is one of the most powerful movements globally, militating for a transparent, equitable, accountable, and sustainable management of natural resources. The organization I lead the Southern Africa Resource Watch maintains very close working relations with Publisher to Pay. It is our wish that uh, this collaboration will expand and consolidate. The United Nations Department of Economic and Social Affairs has estimated that COVID-19 has pushed 131 million people into destitution in 2020. Its long-term effects could be much worse. In Africa, this means increasing unemployment, the expansion of inequality, and deepening of poverty. This is happening at the time when the continent is struggling to deal with the high debt and low commodity prices. There are difficult times ahead for Africa, especially if there is a third wave 
we have been, uh, I've been asked to speak on how mineral resources can fuel development of Africa in the context of post COVID-19 economic recovery. If other nations have used their mineral resources to fuel development, then is there any reason why Africa cannot do the same? Colleagues, COVID-19 pandemic has taken its toll on global economies. There are a number of possible futures for Africa all depend on how Africans, both African leaders and African people respond to the COVID coronavirus and whatever happens next. In recent years, the resource curse has dominated the discourse in an effort to explain why Africa's minerals are not fueling development on the continent. The resource curse theory maintains that the proximity of abundant natural resources to a community has detrimental impacts on the economic and social well being of those people. There is a level of cynicism to suggest that communities because of their geographic position close to the minerals are cursed. Despite the ubiquity of the resource curse, some countries have successfully leveraged their mineral wealth for sustained and substantive economic development. Is the resource curse only applicable to Africa? It is a fact that minerals can fuel development. This is what minerals did for Europe. This is what they are doing for Canada, for Australia, for China, for Chile, for Russia, and other many emerging powers. The question is, why are Africa minerals not producing the same development result for Africa? Africans at different period in the history of the continent have asked the same question over and over again, and have proposed solutions, but nothing has changed. The question is, will COVID-19 be a turning point when Africans take bold steps to break with the abnormal situation where their mineral resources are benefiting more other continents and multinational corporations. The problem is that Africans are failing to implement an optimal policy framework that will ensure minerals create wealth. It is important to recognize that the link between resource abundance and development is not automatic. There are various political and social forces that mediate the relationship between natural resources, wealth, and the development outcomes. COVID-19 happened in the context of relatively weak economic growth on the continent. For some countries, like South Africa, where I am joining you from, COVID-19 hit the economy when growth was already anemic. I don't expect the exploitation of minerals after COVID-19 to make any dent on poverty, inequality, and unemployment unless profound changes are introduced to the current governance model. There isn't much hope that African mineral economies can perform better 
in a pandemic when they have failed to do so in normal situation. COVID-19 has confirmed what we already know about the factors that undermine Africa's ability to turn minerals into development. These factors are internal to Africa, but are also external, and the two are intertwined. Externally, COVID-19 has exposed the neoliberal resource model in which Africa is trapped as a producer and not a consumer of its minerals. The trade in minerals between Africa and the rest of the world is a continuation of the colonial trade regime. There exists a deliberate structural manipulation of the international trade regime to maintain Africa as a supplier of raw materials. If there is a resource curse, its origins should be found in the, in the neoliberal trade regime imposed on Africa. A fundamental question therefore is, how can Africa's minerals fuel development if they are consumed by others. Multinational firms from Europe, North America, and more recently China, still dominate the extraction and, rough and refining of most of, of minerals mined in Africa, while with minimal roles from African firms. Unless we change this relationship, between center and periphery, the role of minerals in Africa's development before COVID-19 will be similar during and post COVID-19. COVID-19 has exposed Africa to dependence on others to draw revenues from its minerals. If others don't want Africa's minerals or are prevented from accessing them as it happened at the peak of the, of the pandemic, then Africa minerals have no value. Because Africa does not consume its own minerals, even though it is the continent most in need of them, and because Africa's revenue is dependent on others to buy its minerals, minerals contribution to development will be no different after COVID-19 than it was before, unless Africa introduces structural changes in the management of its mineral resources. Internally colleagues, COVID-19 has exposed deep-seated inequalities on the continent between social groups, classes, geographies, geographical locations, and gender. The outbreak of COVID-19 pandemic in March 2020, at least it started in the South, in South Africa, found a vulnerable Africa economy. The growth that a number of countries were experiencing was jobless and faceless. The lockdowns in different countries have left thousands and thousands of people who depend on the informal economy, such as artisanal and small scale mining without income and shelter. If we consider that the informal economy is the biggest employer on the continent, COVID-19's biggest impact has not been death although we mourn and regret the people we are losing, but the destitution in which it has put millions of people on the continent. African government have got no resources to provide a social safety net to rescue people from anger and destitution. More people are dying from anger and preventable diseases than from COVID-19. Mining affected communities and mining laborers are particularly vulnerable to COVID-19, with many of them already suffering from diseases 
such as silicosis, tuberculosis, malnutrition, and the other mining related illnesses due to, the, due to mining pollution. COVID-19 has confirmed the multiple failures of corporate social responsibility programs of mining companies. The question asked by Elisa about the money in Niger that mining companies have paid but has not resolved the poverty question raises this fundamental question. Where is the money going? The poor basic infrastructure in mining communities has become vividly visible during COVID-19. Mining companies always take a defensive posture when they are criticized for poor CSR. Under COVID-19, indeed, mining companies have intervened to support communities. Many mining companies have collaborated with local government to support the communities around them. However, this support has been very timid and sporadic, often limited to providing personal protective equipment And uh, in that process, many of local communities found themselves excluded from this protection. This support from mining companies was never aligned with any corporate sustainable mining, sustainable mining plan aimed at improving people's lives. Mining companies failed to seize the opportunity to seize the opportunity to leverage healthcare infrastructure in these communities and provide clean water. One would have expected a far bigger indication of solidarity from mining companies in times of calamity like this one, considering that they were allowed to operate as essential services. But although they are not essential service for most Africans, if this was not enough to protect their bottom line, and to remain profitable. Some companies have violated workers' rights by locking them into mine sites in the name of protecting them from COVID-19, when in reality, this was about securing production. While mining workers' human rights are violated with impunity in Africa's mining sector, in other parts of the world, the same companies that operate on the continent are adopting progressive practices to support the workforce in terms of physical, mental, and emotional health problems brought about by COVID-19. When mining was declared an essential service, vulnerable mining affected communities should have also been provided with extended special protection, not just against COVID-19, but also against exploitative practices, which continue to displace communities from their ancestral land and pollute the environment. The grievances of mining affected communities have continued to be a low key priority for major mining corporations and government during the COVID-19 pandemic. There is a risk, colleagues, that as, an Africa, as, as African countries face with this unprecedented crisis, some may, be, some may be tempted to lower their policy responses that may have a long-term economic implications, including ongoing human rights violations and increased exclusion of vulnerable groups. Mining communities have missed the opportunity to rebuild trust with mining communities. A number of mining companies chose to expose their cupidity, their cupidity despite the fact that mining companies were allowed to operate as part of government essential services. A number of them are pushing African government to provide tax relief measures, citing force majeure. We don't know yet the extent of the impact of these exception, exemptions. The case of Great Dyke in Zimbabwe 
suggest that the impact in terms of losses for governments will be significant. Expecting mining companies to do the right thing without being pushed is just a dream. Civil society needs to provide engagement with mining companies. Civil society needs to, pro to prioritize engagement with mining companies to provide better support to mining communities and mine workers. COVID-19 is not the last in the line of pandemics. Mining companies must invest in long-term healthcare services and integrate communities as part of their operations to ensure that they benefit from clean water, safe energy, uh, secure energy, and better healthcare. A long-term solution is to ensure that mining communities are shareholders in the mines with direct royalties paid to them to invest in their own development. Considering that the challenges African government are experiencing to access vaccines, it is possible that we will have to live under the threat of COVID-19 for longer than we thought. There is therefore a need for civil society to engage mining companies to support African government to acquire sufficient vaccines and speed up the process of recovery. A successful COVID-19 vaccination campaign on the continent requires a strong and well-coordinated public-private partnership. Mining companies must take responsibility to vaccinate their employees, their dependents, and mine communities. Colleagues, rebuilding African economies after a pandemic of this magnitude is a big ask. Rebuilding is never just a matter of putting back structure. Any rebuilding which will rely on continents abundant minerals needs to address prospects for economic recovery along with factors that have hindered the contribution of minerals to development in the first place. Given the extent of the devastation, the economic response required should match, even surpass the scale of the disruption caused. COVID-19 is an opportunity for Africa, therefore, to reclaim its economic independence. And provide its own economic development model. The centrality of the role of the state has been affirmed by COVID-19 globally. And this, I think, Africa needs to pursue. The question is, what kind of states do we need on the continent? In recent times, we have seen the reverse of democratic advances with the increase of authoritarian government across the continent, closing space and making it difficult for civil society and human rights defenders to demand transparency, accountability, and respect for human rights. During the, the ongoing COVID pandemic, state of emergency has become a tool for the violation of fundamental human rights. Civil society in general, and public sure to pay in particular, need to push back its energy and determination. Africa poly, Af in Africa, Politics determine how resources are negotiated, extracted, commercialized, and how revenues are collected and allocated. We know that most of the time revenue allocation is into private pockets. For mineral resources to fuel development, Africans will need to fix the relationship between politics and minerals by vigorously defending democracy and fighting corruption. The internal mismanagement characterized by deep-seated corruption 
is the main factor that is weakening the African state. Corruption is the roadblock to growth and development in Africa. It is estimated that $88.6 billion is drained from Africa annually. Approximately 3% of Africa's GDP because of corruption and illicit financial flows, with the most vulnerable sectors being extractive industries, telecommunication, and financial services. Colleagues, I draw these uh, numbers from a recent organized webinar by Trust Africa, which has uh, the participation of some of the uh, 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 big organization that uh, follow closely the illicit financial flows, including uh, 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 third world, uh, uh, no, uh, 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 tax justice, Africa. Uh, corruption is a significant factor, colleagues, that exposes mining communities to exploitation and exclusion. African government do not have the power to externalize costs to other jurisdictions. The costs are externalized on their people, creating permanent tension and instability. This is different from foreign mining companies and foreign governments who have the power to externalize costs beyond their political jurisdiction, keeping their society stable. The point I'm making is that the manner in which minerals are extracted and commercialized does not allow Africa to tackle the historical structure in inequality, unemployment, and poverty. There is a consensus among Africans today that there should be a substantial structural change in the way we manage the continent resources if we are going to unlock growth and allow for development. It is my conviction that Africa needs to mobilize, to force change that will allow for the value addition of selected strategic minerals on the continent and aggressively pursue local content policy. This is a battle in which no African can stay on the sidelines. This is the battle that publisher to pay Africa should invest in during and post COVID-19. The continent offers a significant market for mining input, capital goods, consumable and services, larger than the EU, Canada and Australia put together. However, in order to take advantage of this huge opportunity, the continental market needs to be realized and meet harmonized local content requirements. Under the challenges brought by COVID-19, we are seeing the growth of nationalistic and un unilateralistic tendencies at the global level. For Africa, this is an opportunity to promote and strengthen regional integration by taking advantage of the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is an opportunity to turn our policies on local content and value addition into practice by creating a unified market that can produce and consume its own manufacturing output in addition to exporting the same goods. Africa has been conditioned to think about its minerals in terms of revenues and not in terms of manufacturing. Africa needs to break with that slavery mentality. The value addition will be to expand the trade on the continent. This is the biggest continent in size. It's also the most populated with a growing middle class, but with the biggest pool of poor people. Africa, as it trades with the rest of the world, must also ensure it consumes its minerals for its own development. The African mining vision is supposed to drive industrialization through local, local beneficiation of minerals and the building of minerals of value chains and strengthening broad-based industrialization. 
Africa must transform itself. Colleagues in responding to the damage caused by COVID-19 and the use of minerals to fuel development, Africa's resilience will not be possible without targeting investment in education. To achieve linkages and industrialization, Africa needs to invest in STEM. Science and technology have been the primary springboard of development in history. So as nation, ad so as nation advance in sciences, they also tend to control their minerals. Besides investing in education, Africa also needs to secure energy security. Africa needs to produce enough reliable energy to be able to ensure growth and achieve its objective of transforming minerals on the continent. We have attached great importance to high value minerals to the detriment of, develop, of development minerals. These are minerals that are mined, processed, and used locally in industries from construction and in manufacturing to agriculture. We need to pay attention to these minerals because they contribute more to poverty alleviation today than high value minerals. The importance of these minerals is rising very fast as the population of Africa increases with many living in urban environment. Civil society and publisher to pay should not neglect to factor into their work the development minerals in favor of the metallic or precious minerals. It is a sector that needs close monitoring not just for economic output, but also for human rights violations, especially child labor, poor health and safety standards, and illicit financial flows. Colleagues, the sector will not produce the development we want if it is gender blind. Equality and economic inclusion of women is a must at all levels and publisher to pay movement must take this as one of its targets in advocacy. After COVID-19, the mining sector will still have to adapt to the realities brought about by climate change. Climate change is one of the most complex and urgent issue currently facing the world due to its impact on the environment and human beings. Africa is the most affected by climate change, although it is least significant polluter. As pressure builds to adopt, to abandon fossil fuels in favor of green energy, the transitional minerals that Africa has in abundance, cobalt, lithium, zinc, platinum, chrome, vanadium, and rare earth will play a determinant role in securing a safe, equitable, and just energy transition. Access to and control over these minerals are already causing tension between nations. They are now at the center of geostrategic power struggle in which Africa remains a spectator. The potential for instability to intensify on the continent caused by those with technological capacity to use them should not be overlooked. These strategic minerals are important in order to realize a lower carbon future and to manufacture cleaner energy technology. The question is, how does Africa want to position itself in the climate change discourse? African must be concerned that these minerals are not contributing toward the industrialization of producing countries due to them being exported as oil or concentrate without significant value addition or any manufacturing or processing 
thus preventing the continent from realizing the full potential of these key minerals contributing to national and regional industrialization. These transitional minerals could be a game changer in the discourse of climate change mitigation and industrial development on the continent. It is my humble submission as I end this presentation that in the wake of COVID-19, Africa needs to reimagine its future differently and publish or to pay Africa must reimagine its intervention to respond to Africa's developmental challenges. The mineral sector remains strategic to support the development of the continent. Africa needs to use its minerals as a foundation for industrialization through localization. And at the same time, ensure environmental sustainability. As we continue to mitigate the impact of COVID-19, and revitalize the mining sector. Africa must also ensure that vulnerable workers, mining communities, indigenous people, the persons with disability and women are protected. Africa needs to be more aspirational. Africa might need a different type of leadership that will accept and pursue a collective development future inside Africa. As President Mangafuli of Tanzania demonstrated, I take this opportunity to present on behalf of African civil society, our deepest condolences to the people of Tanzania. We also congratulate the new president, Ms. Samia Saluo Hassan, and wish her well as she continues where her predecessor left off. Colleagues, Africa must see COVID-19 as an opportunity to not fear the future, but to understand and own it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much. Merci beaucoup. 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 Merci beaucoup de la gouvernance des ressources naturelles en Afrique, un excellent discours que nous avons écouté, entendu, et qui a provoqué beaucoup de questions. Um, we have a great list of questions, um, but the, the transversal issue raised by most of participants is about how natural resources can fuel the development of Africa. How natural resources can fuel development of Africa, including for local communities, for our services, health, education, all those sectors, how they can be fueled or uh, let's say funded by revenues from natural resources. That is a transversal question. Two additional questions. One is about corruption. How can we win the fight against corruption? The other question is, can we use the African mining vision as an effective policy to change how African countries deal with the natural resources and manage it? The last one is about energy transition. Someone said, isn't it time for Africa countries to diversify their resources and invest more on renewable energies? These are the, let's say the transversal questions which came from all the speakers. So Dr. Claude, I can give you around three to five minutes to answer to this question. Thank you. Thank you. I, I think uh, for the first question, how can mineral fuel development? I think uh, some of the element have been uh, I referred to in my speech. The, the, there are two things. I think we need to learn 
from uh, those who have uh, used their minerals before us and how they did it. You will see that all the countries and continents have used the same approach. Is really to use minerals first to provide to, to, to build uh, industries and produce goods, which then they can export and use locally. Now, Africa has not done that. Africa is only focusing on one leg, that of uh, taxing the, the exploitation of minerals. Revenues are important. And uh, if utilized properly, can also support the development. But if we are going to optimally maximize the benefits of our resources, we need both approach. Where we use certain minerals, we need to identify them to add value because by building linkages, backward and forward linkages, we start to build, to create new, new economies around the mining sector, new industries that can then absorb some of the unemployment that can create goods that we can consume because as we export minerals and then import the, the finished goods, those goods are more expensive than our minerals we exported. So that would also create, the, put us in, in the dead situation where we are because we are not building sufficient, uh, uh, we are not benefiting a lot from our minerals. This is also the same in agriculture. Uh, it's the same approach where we are still exporting uh, raw products instead of uh, turning them into usable goods on the continent. That one. Uh, but the, the entire problem is that as Africa, as Africa cannot do all these things without the, the required skills and the technolo the technological knowledge. Uh, today, no technology is available across the world. It's just a matter of accessing it. You can buy technology, whatever you want, and buy uh, the skills you want and pay it well. You, but here we are focusing, we need to invest in education and not just any education. If we are going to benefit to these minerals within our countries, we need to invest in science, in technology. That's how others have done it. There is no country that has successfully benefited from its minerals without doing these things. And uh, I think it's, uh, it's something we need to do because if we've been talking about this since uh, independence and nothing has happened and uh, one will understand the hopelessness uh, among uh, uh, citizens of this continent. But I think uh, it, it will need courageous leadership. You understand we are in a global economy. Uh, we have regimes uh, that, uh, control how we trade and we need to be to find ways of uh, building what first we can consume on the continent and if we succeed that we then could be able to to be comfortable in terms of benefiting more from our, our mineral resources so my point is that revenue is very important but very limited in terms of maximizing benefits of mineral resources. We need to, to move and build uh, and localize resources to ensure that uh, we can produce goods. We have a big market and we can trade on the continent. Corruption is a big, uh, is a big uh, problem. And uh, it seems it's getting worse every time we speak about it, but it's also about leadership. Uh, and commitment to fighting corruption. You don't fight corruption once and forget. It's a continuous uh, struggle. Just as for civil society, I think it's a battle we need to engage in within civil society, but also looking at government and companies to ensure that we, we expose continuously corruption 
But corruption will not be resolved without sanction. Those who are cor corrupt needs to be sanctioned. And uh, that's why we need uh, an independent judicial system on the continent in our countries to ensure that corrupt people are prosecuted. Without that, we are losing the fight against corruption. I know in countries where corrupt people become stars, they are sung by musicians as the best in society. That is not good example. We need to fight corruption and put sanction in place and uh, uh, prosecute. Many countries cannot do that. Unless we do that, corruption will be part of our lives. The African mining vision is effectiveness. Look, it is, a, it is a more progressive vision, which speaks really to all the issues we are all concerned with, from uh, uh, transparency in terms of uh, across the entire value chain in the mineral sector. Uh, it speaks about uh, protecting the environment. It speaks about protecting the human rights. But this time, it's more an internal vision from African leaders. But what we've seen that uh, it's difficult to implement because there is a, a gap between policy and implementation. The leaders have adopted it, but they've forgotten that they've, they've adopted it. If the African mining vision is still alive, it's because of African civil society pushing and continue to push and to remind African leaders that it's important to put in practice what we've, you've adopted. And that is the struggle we need to engage in uh, continuously to ensure that it's implemented. So far, many African governments have adopted policies, very progressive, which can be aligned to the African mining vision. Uh, we've seen uh, many countries really speaking about value addition and local content, uh, 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 industrialization linked to the mineral sector. Those are good enough as policies, but they need to be implemented. And I think the problem with Africa is implementation. And that's where we need to focus. And that's why the advocacy becomes important. Uh, transitional uh, uh, minerals, uh, renewable energy, we can't avoid that. We, we, we am very happy that Publisher to Pay is investing time to think and reflect on uh, how uh, this uh, energy transition uh, should be, should, must be ensured it's fair, just to everybody, uh, including Africans, uh, Africa, the least polluter. But that's a debate Africans need to get involved in. If we are going to transit to green energy, There are, there are reparations of our loss. And the question, and which has been discussed at Global Forum, who's going to, to pay for that? Africa, I don't think we, we've got, all the countries got resources to invest consistently to ensure energy transition. The question is, Who's going to pay for that? Here, yeah. and those are those are difficult questions, but important that uh, we need to pose as civil society to ensure that we are at the cutting edge of this discussion, and to ensure that Africa, uh, as uh, it transit from fossil fuel, also is supported in this energy transition. Uh, Chair, I will stop there. I think those are the questions that were asked. Great, thank you so much, Claude. Um, we are running over time. Uh, merci beaucoup à tous. Uh, C'était une excellente prestation de la part de Dr. Claude Kavemba. On aimerait bien l'applaudir à main forte comme ça. C'est un plaisir de l'écouter. Il a fait un message assez poignant, retracer effectivement la situation 
les tendances, la gouvernance des ressources naturelles, mais notamment les défis qui ont été soulevés, y compris la question de la COVID qui a été posée comme question. Comment la COVID constitue à la fois une opportunité pour nous, mais aussi pour les compagnies et les États, parce que nous avons remarqué que pendant cette COVID, les États ont utilisé un bon prétexte pour pouvoir aussi restreindre à un certain moment les libertés des personnes. Donc, tout ça, ce sont des préoccupations qui ont été soulevées. Chers amis, euh, nous avons le plaisir de vous dire qu'encore une fois, les discussions continuent. Dans la journée, nous avons encore deux autres thématiques sur lesquelles nous allons nous attarder. Très importante, comment nous adapter en situation de crise en panel multi-acteurs avec divers acteurs qui vont présenter plusieurs scénarios, y compris les scénarios que publier ce que vous payez avait développé au niveau international. Donc, dans, disons, 25 minutes, on vous invite à rejoindre ce panel qui sera présenté par une panoplie de, 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 de panélistes. Ensuite, la question des droits des femmes comme priorité dans la gouvernance des ressources naturelles. Les femmes ont été toujours laissées en rade dans la question de la gouvernance de façon générale et des ressources naturelles de façon générale. Nous allons aussi aborder cette question-là à partir de 13h GMP. Une heure GMP, nous allons aborder cette question-là avec aussi de brillants panélistes venant de divers secteurs de l'industrie, du gouvernement, et de divers continents, de diverses expériences que nous allons avoir dessus. Alors, ceci dit, nous vous invitons à ces panels, mais aussi au panel de demain à partir de 9h. Mais avant de nous séparer pour le moment pour aller en pause, euh, vous voyez déjà sur l'écran défiler le programme d'aujourd'hui et de demain. Si vous n'avez pas pu vous inscrire ou vous voulez inviter vos collègues, vos amis à s'inscrire, c'est toujours possible. Partagez-leur le lien qui est euh, ici au niveau du chat box. Et enfin, chers amis, je voudrais, pour les questions logistiques encore, renvoyer la parole à mes collègues et amis, Sandrine, euh, vous avez au moins passé pour les questions logistiques, pour euh, une petite enquête de satisfaction. Merci, Demba. On vient de mettre les liens dans le chat. Comme ça, les gens peuvent cliquer dessus directement et l'enquête le, sera euh, aussi directement en anglais à la fin du webinaire. Donc, c'est bien pour nous. Merci beaucoup, Demba. Merci beaucoup, Sandrine. Donc, chers amis, cliquez sur le lien... Dans le chat, ça vous permet de répondre à une petite enquête de satisfaction de d'une minute maximum. Et ça vous permettra, bien sûr, de nous donner votre feedback très rapidement pour que nous puissions savoir comment continuer avec la suite. Vous avez peut-être une ou deux minutes pour le faire et c'est vite fait.